Well, welcome everyone to GeoHug. So I'm Jess from Prospectors and CoreSafe. We're your exploration gear and core handling experts. And I'm your virtual host today. Uh, so I'm just gonna put you all on mute now, um, if you can stay on mute for the presentation, but please use the chat. And if you have any questions at all, uh, we'll throw some hands at the end of the presentation. Uh, but thank you um, so much for coming on as our special rock star today. Uh, so Hans is the Senior Vice President of Exploration for Coal Mining. Uh, with over 35 years of experience in the mineral exploration business, 16 of which were with senior producers such as Newmont uh, and Kennecott Rio Tinto. Uh, served, also served as on boards uh, for a number of junior explorers uh, with projects in Quebec, Nevada, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Peru and Bolivia. Uh, so I'm really excited to hear about Coe's upcoming exploration plans. So thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. Okay, welcome to uh, my presentation. Um, what I would, what I'm going to try to do with this presentation is, in order to keep it short, I got pretty excited when when Jess asked me to to put together a presentation about Coor and and make it a virtual uh, presentation. We've got so much to talk about in exploration at Coor, so much happening. We've got our, the largest budget ever in the company's history. Currently, we have 19 drills turning on uh, six projects, and um, we just released our mid-year exploration results on August 11th, if you want to go to our website and see those. And in that, in that I tried to uh, actually make sense of a lot of really good results across the six oper or six projects that we were drilling. The, um, actually with an emphasis on five of the projects uh, that we had assay results for at that time. Um, so what I'll do to today is, uh, first of all, let everybody read this. Okay, good. Um, the, the, I'd like to introduce just quickly the company um, uh, and then the focus of the company and, and then the focus of our exploration program and, how it relates to our strategy at CORE, because we're, we're very strongly, we're very cohesive in terms of operations, working with exploration, working with um, all kinds of different aspects of, of how we permit and drill and mine. And the idea is to have uh, a continuous long-term, long mine life for all of our operations. Um, and as I go through really quickly here, I'll just describe the I'll describe the other operations, starting from uh, the north. Silver Tip is a uh, lead zinc silver mine. Currently, uh, we've got it on care and maintenance while we do a pre-feasibility study and aggressively drill it. We've got six rigs turning. I think one just left the property today, so down to five, uh, with the idea that we're we're growing the the uh, pro the project, the asset there to justify expanding the mill. Uh, fantastic place to work, absolutely gorgeous area. Kensington, literally right over the border, uh, based out of Juneau is a completely different type of ore deposit. It's an orogenic gold mine. Um, it's uh, high grade veins, con structurally controlled. And um, by contrast to a flat lying uh, ore body at silver tip, the, all the veins are vertical and very difficult to drill and expand. Um, so needless to say, I didn't want to talk about that project today. Wharf um, over in South Dakota in the famous uh, Black Hills near Lead, where Homestake mined um, something like uh, 40 million ounces over 120 years. We're literally four miles away in a sediment hosted uh, open pit heap leach project. And uh, that drill program is actually just wrapping up. So um, we'll have that rig move over to the Crown Sterling projects here in about two weeks. Uh, the other project I won't talk about today, but I'll mention quickly is the Palmarejo project in Mexico. Uh, when that's running full speed, that produces about 50% of the company's revenue. So a very important project, obviously. And it's a, it's a, um, a silver gold project. Uh, also, epithermal veins, but much larger volume. The, the mill has capacity for 6,000 tons per day, and, and we do hit that occasionally with our underground operation. What I'd like to talk about today is the activity that's been focused in the Great Basin of the USA, uh, specifically at the Rochester mine, which is a silver gold mine. 
and at our new acquisitions called Crown Sterling, which are just two hours drive north of Las Vegas. Um, the company has gone through a bit of a, uh, a consolidation, as I have with my career, moving from working in North and South America to just working in North America and focusing on North American assets, and really specifically in the U.S., where uh, we see 58% of our revenue generated at this time. Um, and we are a bit more diverse, but still 69% of our revenue is coming from gold. The, the silver has, has dropped off considerably over the last couple of years. So um, even though we used to be considered a silver company, Coeur d'Alene Mines used to be in the Silver uh, Valley near Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And uh, now we, we're based in, in Chicago and really focused more on gold assets uh, in North America. The zinc and lead, uh, we aren't producing right now, but uh, when we are, that would be the, uh, the uh, revenue stream from, the, from the, basically from the silver tip mine. Um, this is another uh, corporate slide that basically shows um, how we're intending to move forward and how we've moved forward over the past five years. And you can see, and what's, what's really my, my part of the business on the lower level, how exploration budgets have ramped up. Um, 2014 and 2015 were, were pretty tough years in the metals business. Uh, 2019 and 2020, we started to ramp things up. And this is just expensed exploration. If you include capitalized exploration, the numbers get closer to um, 47 to $54 million in our annual budget this year. And uh, I don't see that slowing down, but uh, obviously that depends on metal prices and, and how things turn out this year. But this is our biggest, biggest budget ever and fantastic results. Uh, we've, it's almost like we had pent up demand for uh, this budget this year. Um, also, even though it is um, one year delayed, the PNP uh, proven and probable gold reserves and then silver reserves have grown in sync with the exploration budgets, as you'd hope. Now that's actually a testament to the quality of our assets. Again, uh, when you talk about what the key drivers are to the company, exploration gets the biggest box here. And there's you really have to deliver value with the drill bit to grow mine lives, increase grades, thus profit margin, and, uh, and provide more security that the company can make plans around a, a solid mine model, resource model, reserve model, mine plan. So the, the new uh, discoveries I'll talk about today are, are shown in the exploration, the Sterling Crown Seahorse discoveries. And then I'll just talk briefly about uh, Rochester also, but, but won't, I won't, to, and Lincoln Hill, but I won't uh, allude to some of these other uh, near mine programs that we've got going on right now. Um, and, and so here's a slide that kind of summarizes the focus of my talk. The, the, both of these um, assets that I'm gonna talk about today uh, are, are basically in a very stable jurisdiction and have the potential to, to provide a long, profitable mine life for Coor. It's the kind of thing that really creates a, a much more stable uh, future for the company. And with it, we've, we've pumped in more and more money each year to these exploration programs. The slide on the left shows our land position around the Rochester assets. The, uh, the dark blue is Rochester itself, and that's a uh, land position we've had since uh, 1983. And then the gray, light blue, and, per and, and red are um, assets we've added through an acquisition from Alio Gold um, in 2018, I think that was. Um, so that, that basically gives us a gigantic land position, not only to develop our mine, but also to grow and provide a pipeline for future feed to the, to the mine. And I'll talk, talk about those a little bit more on future slides. Um, and then on the, on the more pipeline growth project side, the Southern Nevada assets, which I'll talk about in detail at the end of the presentation, we acquired in late 2018. There's a, a very large land position down near Beatty, Nevada. 
in a historic district uh, that has had production, has had sediment hosted gold, heap leach gold production, and um, has suddenly just seen a resurgence in activity from uh, a number of companies, including ourselves, Corvus Gold, Anglo Gold, and Kinross. So that's quite an exciting area, and I'll, I'll talk about that more in detail as we get, get down to that, those slides. So moving to the, uh, the Rochester asset, this is a uh, really cool part of the world. Uh, like a lot of the historic districts in Nevada, the 1860s were, were boom time. 18, most people have heard of the 1849 gold rush in California, where uh, 1848, we actually bought California from Mexico and then that uh, spurred a lot of migration of people out west and the discoveries of uh, the Virginia City gold mines in 1849 and then eventually Comstock Lode numerous other districts in Nevada were, were discovered at that time. And Rochester was one of them. But what really turned Rochester into a rush was the discovery in 1910, 1911, and 1912. And I just want to point out something on this slide, and I'll allude to it later on. That discovery actually was, led to the mining of 12 ounce per ton silver, 0.1 ounce per ton gold from uh, high-grade structures and veins at the Rochester mine. Now at the end of the presentation, in the appendix, we have the reserves and resources for Rochester. We're mining a half an ounce per ton silver equivalent from the Rochester mine. So that's, that shows you that number one, high-grade is, is possible here. The old timers went after it, but uh, now we're mining this, this half ounce per ton and profitably. So the history is described here. Um, the exciting part of uh, Coors uh, process through the years here has been our, our 150 millionth ounce pour in uh, 2017. And looking forward <clears throat> on the uh, reserves and resources, and then what I can see for growth, we can see another 150 million ounces uh, in the next 20 years here. And then I'll quickly talk later in the presentation about <clears throat> the updated PEA, which includes a new technology called HPGR, high pressure grinding roll. <clears throat> okay, into the fun part. Uh, photo looking northeast at the high wall above the Rochester pit. Over in the, uh, on the road here is a haul truck. I think that's a 160 ton haul truck. So you can see how high that high wall is relative to the truck. And what you see in the high wall is the, this, the not only the bland oxidized um, Rochester and Weaver formation, Weaver's on the top, Rochester's on the bottom. These are the ore hosts, but these structures that are almost uh, horizontal dipping to the west in this case, that are very, very important for upgrading the ore. And uh, so that's typical, that's the North High Wall. And some of the uh, samples shown on the bottom left here, um, and, and then their locations along the lower part of the High Wall and their grades are shown here. Two and a half ounce per ton silver, 2.4 ounce per ton silver, 0.9 ounce per ton. So very difficult to actually tell when you're in good grade, although we are drilling some core now that, uh, that makes it much easier to see. Uh, and we are seeing some pretty good grade in the core we're drilling in East Rochester. Uh, typically, it's very difficult to, to map grade here. Um, now, what I'm about to uh, show you is, is um, going to basically make you rethink about how, to, how you would explore this deposit. And basically, most people think of, of uh, ore deposits as being formed from the bottom up. Um, what Rochester is, is a secondary silver event that has come from uh, acid solutions precipitating down through the rocks above, mobilizing silver, and then re-precipitating silver by replacing zinc and sphalerite. Um, the first person to actually map this and propose this was Adolf Knopf in 1924. And uh, he even had some petrographic pictures in his, uh, in his book uh, about this um, event. And uh, I have one of his 
geologic maps on my wall in my office in, in Chicago. It's such a classic map. But this um, is kind of counterintuitive, especially in, in silver systems. I've seen, them, I've seen this happen in, in copper deposits where you get calcocyte uh, forming on pyrite and you get a calcocyte blanket upgrading the grade of the copper deposit. Well, this, this is what's happening at, at Rochester and this is what makes ore. Uh, otherwise, it's too low grade to mine as a standalone silver deposit. Now, the other thing it does is it makes it leachable. So we use a uh, cyanide leach and a Merrill Crow um, finish to uh, extract the ore. So the uh, mineral that the silver is, is, is acanthite and it's also like, it's also argentite. And in the image here, you can see the description here from Knopf describing as argentite. What I've included on the lower right is a photo micrograph of, uh, um, from a thesis that was done, uh, that we, we sponsored at the University of Nevada, uh, a young woman named Tracy Anderson, Tracy Kemp is her, her name now, uh, showed with a modern study that this, this truly does happen. So what this micrograph is showing, sphalerite in the middle, acanthite rim around the outside, and covalite uh, is also part of the rim on the outside here. So you have copper, lead, and zinc as part of the mineralization here. But what really makes this a silver deposit is the secondary upgrade of silver over the sphalerite. What I don't include here in her thesis, she's got lots more of these pictures of acanthite completely replacing sphalerite. Uh, and that's the higher grade ores is when you, when you get that to happen. So that's quite exciting to think about Rochester like that. And what it does is it makes you think about more about not drilling out the roots of the system, but drilling out what would be the conduits and, and what would emplace the higher grade mineralization. And those conduits are in the image I showed earlier of the photo of the high wall with these horizontal uh, structures. Uh, having breccia zones along them, and then vertical structures, which is where the old timers mined this uh, 10 and 12 ounce per ton silver and 0.1 ounce per ton gold. So vertical structures, horizontal structures are absolutely key to the precipitation of silver and then also upgrading the deposit simply by producing conduits for meteoric fluids, which become acidic to move the silver down. Um, the, the image on bo both of these images, by the way, are from Tracy's thesis. And um, so this leads me into the, the second part of the discussion of Rochester. You can see a, a layer here that's uh, the higher grade layer along the, the Weaver Rochester contact. And the pit limit is actually shown in a very light color in the upper image here. So as the pit winds down here and we look for more ore, where do we look? Well, we started drilling in 2014 under a leach pad. Uh, anybody knows in the exploration business, drill under uh, anything that mining and engineers have built, whether it's an admin building or a crusher or a leach pad, that's where you're gonna find more ore. And sure enough, under East Rochester, we actually had some historic holes from a Sarco that led us in this direction. We found some high grade and it's, not only is it high grade, it's like three times the grade of the um, reserves at Rochester. And I'll show you some of the, the latest assays, including some high grade zones like this hit here, which is 71 ounce per ton silver. So the, the, some of these high grade zones that the old timers were chasing still exist. This is under the water table. So it probably was not mined by them because they didn't want to pump out a, a drift. And um, we've come back now and done quite an aggressive program in 2018 and 2019, following up on this concept, drilling a little bit more horizontal holes to, to try to grow this into inferred and, and measured and indicated. And then with our new mine plan uh, called POA11, rescope and, and bring in some of this higher grade material uh, sooner in the mine, in the, in the new leaching the, or new leach pad that we're going to build out to the uh, north. Um, this map shows the latest from uh, the August 11th news release, and um, you can see long uh, 1.7 ounce, 0.5 ounce, 1.3 ounce per ton silver intercepts. So these are 
uh, 40, 50, 100 percent higher than the resource reserve grade of 0.45 ounce per ton silver, and then much higher gold grade too. Uh, the gold grade of the reserve is 0.003 ounce per ton. Uh, by the way, for international folks, that's uh, 15 grams per ton silver and 0.1 gram per ton gold, and we still make money. Um, so these. These holes are all angled under the leach pad one and leach pad two, and not one of these holes is missed. It's been absolutely a fantastic uh, drilling program. There's been a total of uh, 10 hole or 12 holes drilled now, and uh, we're shutting down for the season, continuing north with a reverse circulation rig. Uh, these are all core holes here and growing this to the north. So as you can see, this is gonna add just by volume alone uh, quite a bit to the reserve base in the future at Rochester. The um, POA 11, which uh, is a plan of operations amendment number 11 for the, for the mine, got approved and we're moving forward with it. We've begun construction of, of a, a 300 million ton leach pad to the north of the pit. And with that, we're implementing a technology called HPGR. Uh, and doubling the crushing rate. So we've got to have more reserves, more resources. And, and what I'm working on with the team on Rochester at Rochester is this the great improvement from East Rochester and anywhere else we can find in the pit and, and, and surrounding areas to, to feed this machine over the next couple of years. And what we found HPR, HPGR has done is give you much, much better re, uh, recoveries 70% recovery of silver in two years versus 60% over 20 years with conventional crushing. So I mentioned uh, a bullet point earlier in the, in the presentation, how we've doubled, doubled the net asset value of this asset by simply introducing HPGR. Uh, and this is why, because you basically bring all that recovery forward to just two years instead of 20 years. And then once all that's, uh, well, we're going to basically be drilling around the Rochester pit and close to infrastructure. We're also going to launch on a fairly aggressive program beginning mid-2021 of uh, the Lincoln Hill, Independence Hill, and Gold Ridge areas where um, Alio Gold ha has sold us these assets and Rye Patch had, had formerly been exploring these areas. Um, the grade of this um, material is about 0.011 ounce per ton gold. So it's about 3.7 times the gold grade of uh, Rochester. And it's 0.34 ounce per ton silver or 10 gram silver, which is almost up to the grade of, of Rochester with, at 0.45 ounce per ton silver. So obviously these assets, uh, are quite exciting in that they have the grade and they're very close to what will eventually be our future leach pad uh, shown here as uh, stage six heap leach right here where my cursor is. So Rock, Lincoln Hill, Independence Hill and Gold Ridge in the blue here all will feed into this uh, leach pad over here. So that's Rochester. Uh, now we'll move on to uh, our pipeline project, very new for the company and um, very exciting. The, the Bullfrog District is an interesting area. I, my history with Newmont and later with Kennecott was really northern Nevada. Uh, I, I remember doing a little bit of work down around Tonopah, a bit of work in western Nevada with Newmont and um, actually working in Goldfield for Kennecott. Uh, on a discovery there, but never never spent any time in Beatty. I just heard about it. And finally now we're down there. It's a, it's a great place. It's pro mining. They've had a, a long history of start and stop mining and a desert town with, with great infrastructure uh, and only a thousand people. So uh, I would say they're probably hungry for, uh, for some new activity. The historic uh, discoveries and production amounted to somewhere around 4 million ounces, but the bullfrog mine itself generated about 2.3 million ounces. The, the last operator was Barrick after they purchased Lac Minerals. 
uh, and they shut it down in, in uh, 1999. The interesting part of this story is that uh, in addition to bullfrog prospecting around the Bear Mountains, really led to this fluorite uh, production. And for those of you who are, are in tune with what fluorite implies as far as intrusive activity, um, it, it ends up being part of the story here. Uh, the fluorite was mined, but also there was gold associated with it, especially at the, at the Daisy mine or the Kroll mine uh, that we own now. Uh, but also around by the Sterling deposit, there are a few other areas where fluorite was mined. And, and we're seeing this magmatic signature in our assays that clearly shows alkalic uh, source or magmatic source for at least some of our mineralization in the Bear Mountains. So to me, that says that there was a good, strong heat source to pump up the, the fluids here. And um, as we start digging into targets in, in the Bear Mountains, it's becoming more and more clear the, the role of these intrusive uh, bodies. Um, the, the, the assets that we purchased in uh, 2018 included a, a large land package, uh, 143 square kilometers in the Bear Mountains. And um, basically it's uh, 1,840 claims almost. In terms of acres, 35,500 acres. And now we've, uh, we were, actually second to the game here. Um, Corvus has been here for quite a while and we basically bought that package that surrounded their mother load project. And then Anglo came into the fold and now Kinross has staked the areas in green here uh, on the east side of, of uh, Beatty, or sorry, east side of us and east and west side of Beatty. So it's become quite active. Uh, we run into geologists all the time now in the restaurants in Beatty. It's kind of like the, the boom used to be uh, or the boom times up in northern Nevada back in the 1980s. Um, the Bear Mountains um, creates a large opportunity and it also creates uh, quite a challenge geologically. The, I've never seen anything like this. The, the uh, gold mineralization is hosted in um, nine different zones here that we're aware of so far. And actually Mother Lode and Seahorse are new to the, to the game. So even before that, there was seven. Um, and these are, these are uh, from, pre, from Neoproterozoic all the way up to Miocene age host rocks. So gold can be anywhere. So how do you focus on, on you know, drilling, where to look? So we've basically taken the approach um, in, in, in terms of how to approach this, the whole range of doing good geology, good, good geophysics, geochemistry, you know, your, your core techniques for finding gold, but then incrementally expanding the known resources at DAISY, um, Secret Pass, SNA, and down at the Sterling Mine. And at the same time, applying for much larger drill programs in the future once we get a better handle on the geology. Um, the I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the Seahorse and the mother load areas in just a second here. The other interesting thing here is, is there's a, a few pulses of mineralization, uh, dates of which range from eight to 14 million years. So any rocks that are 15 million years or older are potential hosts. Generally, we're seeing carbonates as being important hosts here. A lot of these are carbonates that are hosts in other parts of Nevada, uh, but it's very tough to predict because uh, faults and, and, and major structural intersections can also create uh, breaches, collapse breaches, and, and uh, introduce dikes and, and uh, be good gold hosts too. So it's very complicated. And I'll actually show you uh, our, our Sterling project and some new drill results at the end here of this section and uh, show you just how good the grades can be when you, when you hit the right stuff. Um, coming into the project, coming into the acquisition from Northern Empire, we had the Daisy resource, and this is a great example of a sediment-hosted gold project. It's oxide, it's 80% recovery if you heat bleach it, and it's hosted in uh, algal dolomitic limestones and um, shaley limestones, and as soon as you get too dolomitic, the host goes away, the porosity goes away, so it's kind of a classic uh, sediment hosted gold system structure 
lithology contacts are the key here. And as we've had time over the last two years to map the canyon around Daisy and going up to Storage Secret Pass and SNA, we've gotten a much better handle on where to continue growing and drilling uh, these various resources in this area. Now moving, uh, moving on to the uh, tertiary <laughs> or the uh, Miocene uh, host rocks. Um, Corvus, like I said, was before us in the area. In fact, um, their geologist, Mark Reichman, is just a, a fantastic uh, source of, of knowledge for us. We've got a CA with Corvus and we've both agreed this is, it's better if we move forward together to understand the geology in this district. It's much easier to understand where you are, where you're drilling, when you drill something, it's normally not outcropping. So uh, understanding the geology before you start drilling is, is key. Um, they've, they've done a fantastic job of compiling all of the different uh, ages, big structures, uh, intrusive events in the district and their com compilation map from their website is shown here on the left. And you can see the, um, basically the Bear Mountains are this large mountain range right here. Sterling is down to the south. Uh, the reward deposit, which is owned by Waterton, is over here on the west side. And um, both those um, projects are hosted in the older part of the stratigraphic sequence. The, as you move north, you start getting into the younger Paleozoic rocks. Daisy uh, is hosted in, like I just showed you, in the Cambrian. And then Secret Pass crosses the line and and jumps into the tertiary. And like Motherlode, which is shown here on the right, can be hosted in either the Paleozoics or the tertiary rocks or the intrusive rocks. So this is a, this is a, this has blown the district open when, when Corvus started drilling these holes and exposing what is, few, what is potential new mineralization that hadn't been recognized before here. Uh, both oxides and sulfides, but hosted in a combination of, of intrusives, dikes cutting the Paleozoic rocks, uh, intrusives along the key structures like this Florespar Canyon Fault, which is uh, shown right here on the west side of the project. Um, and I'll show you that in some geophysical data in just a bit. That's the key uh, detachment fault that connects the district here in the Bear Mountains to the Bullfrog Mine over to the west. And then Farther up in the sequence, you start seeing more and more oxide gold mineralization. And uh, I'll talk about it in just a minute here. The, our new seahorse discovery is even higher in the sequence here. We're about a mile north of this uh, mother load discovery. Again, another example of, of a cross-section, a model, gold mineralization hosted in the Paleozoics, the tertiary, tertiary dikes, intrusives, and tertiary sediments. In fact, the Joshua Hollow sediments are in some places very similar looking to a Paleozoic limestone. They're platy uh, carbonate, uh, se uh, carbonate cement sediments that are volcanics. So uh, they just make great hosts and they're, they're right on the edge. They typically right on the edge of this Florespar Canyon fault where they've been structurally prepared. And um, that's pretty much the key here is identifying that. Over on the, oh, sorry. Over on the left part of the slide here, you see this Flores Bar Canyon fault coming along and the mystery prior to Corvus, Corvus's drilling and our, our work now with the geophysics was where does this detachment go? And clearly now we know it goes straight north, almost north, north, northeast. And, um, when it's over by the Bullfrog project, it's almost east-west, so everybody thought it maybe it had more of an easterly uh, azimuth to it, but clearly the drilling is showing, the geophysics is showing that it makes a bend right here, and that's absolutely critical for localizing the projects, the resources, and the targets that we're working on right now. Stepping back again, um, actually this air mag, I encouraged when we, we had a 13% part of Northern Empire. I encouraged um, Northern Empire to fly this as just a first data, data set database, which uh, if any of you have used um, AirMag, it's just a great way to 
uh, tie together a district, and particularly when you have volcanics, intrusive activity, and sediments, which are typically not magnetic, the character you'll get in your, your images really helps you with uh, regional structures, intrusives, the volcanic paleozoic contact, and so it's a good first step before uh, you know embarking on major structural in interpretation or geologic mapping. In this case, I'm presenting first vertical derivative, which enhances the, the, the higher frequencies in the magnetics. So you see, uh, like for example, some of this is a syngenetic magnetite in the uh, Paleozoic rocks, uh, but it also enhances this north-south structure right here, which now we know is the Bear Mountain Fault. And it's a very important fault for linking mineralization down at our Sterling mine with a couple of other mineral occurrences on the range, and it comes all the way up and cuts our Seahorst discovery. So Seahorst to Sterling is almost six miles, uh, four and a half kilometers. Absolutely tremendous to see this continuity. And we know now too from geologic work along this fault, there are mineralized zones uh, that we need to start prospecting. This is a, basically no man's land. Not much work has been done along this. Um, then up in the north, you can see the, the Floresbar Canyon Fault clearly as it, uh, it shows the onlapping tertiary volcanics on top of the Paleozoics, which are not magnetic to the south. And you can see where the fault makes a, a nice bend to the north here and then gets, it's basically uh, unmappable up there. Uh, we, ran we ran gravity. I'm a huge fan of gravity. Back when I worked for Newmont on the Carlin trend, we did, uh, we mapped the entire trend with helicopter gravity. And uh, it was one of our best tools for mapping basement structures, which are some of the key conduits for mineralization. And so this technique here identified a, not only the Floresbach Canyon fault coming through Daisy and Secret, but also a nice little horse block uh, up to the north here, which now we call Seahorst. Um, and then it also maps the Bear Mountain Falls as it goes down to Sterling. So it's a, another tool for us to, to use while we're uh, trying to interpret uh, the geology and the main structures here. Now, when you start zooming in, this is the northern part of the Bear Mountains called the Crown Block. And um, we've located a bunch of our targets along this structure now that we know from geochemistry, from alteration, from drilling. The Daisy resource and, and the Daisy South resource, the Secret Pass resource are right here near the Floresbar Canyon Fault. And, uh, and then into the volcanics, you can see a number of other structures going north-south. And then the SNA resource is right here. Mother Lode, uh, Corvus's Mother Lode project is right here. You can see the character of the uh, magnetics changing completely as you head up over the Mother Lode and into the uh, Seahorst part of the property where we're drilling new uh, ore hits um, as we speak. And then you can also see along the east side here where the, uh, the Bear Mountain Fault has come up from the south and is cutting the volcanics up here. Now when you, zoom, when you use the, the gravity data and you apply something called a horizontal gradient, things start to really stand out. Um, and this is what led us to drill Seahorst. Uh, this really is a vector to uh, what I would consider a, one of the main structural intersections in the Bear Mountains. And so you've got the Floresbar Canyon Fault following this gradient here. Basically, you plot faults right on the highest part of the horizontal gradient. Uh, kind of an interesting caveat here is where there is a second uh, fault here in the gravity and possibly a couple other splays that show up, which we are targeting uh, this fall and, and next uh, spring with our new plan of operations drilling. Uh, and then it comes along and localizes the mother load and then comes north and guess where Seahorst is exactly at the intersection of Flores Park Canyon and um, the Bear Mountain Fall here. So here's the, the results we announced August 11th. Um, we've drilled to date 39 holes, um, 30, five of which are specifically in and around where these results are coming, are being called out of this image. 
We've only got assays for um, 12 of the holes so far. Uh, the assay labs, uh, one of the um, un unfortunate side effects of COVID is the prep labs are extremely slow and the assay labs have about a two month turnaround here. So we're uh, actually, we're almost three months ahead drilling, waiting for assays here, but it's quite agonizing knowing that we're seeing mineralization visually in the logs, but not getting the assays back to do our future planning and future drilling uh, in the Seahorse area. Having said that, some great results. Hole number two, the top of the slide was the discovery hole. It, uh, as you can see here, 235 feet of 0.05 ounce per ton. That's one and a half grams per ton. Oxide, we've done heap leach tests on it, really quick heap leach tests, and we're seeing about 80% recovery. This is a dream. And uh, follow-up holes have been showing similar, although you can't expect everything to be exact with drilling, uh, similar type results. And um, so we're, we're obviously very excited about what we're seeing here. Um, the the uh, other thing I'd like to point out in this slide, we don't have the land map on here, but basically from SNA to the seahorse pad, it's about, oh, it's about a mile and a half uh, two miles, depending on where you draw a line here at SNA. So two kilometers. And there's no drill holes. Um, there's, there's some um, engineering holes for engineering for drill pads and things like that from the historic mining here. But basically, this is now open. And you remember the um, projection of the faults through here. So the back, back one slide, um, all this area between SNA and, and Seahorst is open for drilling. Now we've just received a 300 acre plan of operations approval from the BLM. So uh, we have now the ability to start building pads and stepping out away from what were once uh, five acre disturbances, very minimal uh, area that we were able to drill when we bought this property. And now we can start, start expanding our drill programs we're going to have to do an amendment to get up to Seahorse with this 300 acres, but we hope to get that amendment approved in the next six months. And that will enable us to, to move up to the north here. We'll get a second rig uh, on this project uh, once they're done at the wharf uh, mine in two weeks and, uh, and start really aggressively expanding our resources here, DAISY, Secret, SNA, and, and Seahorse especially. Um, some more um, fire, I guess, for the for food for thought and, and fire for the story. Uh, we ran some geophysics. Uh, one of the one of the better techniques for mapping resistivities in, in this part of the world, audio magnetotelluric, uh, that basically looks down about three kilometers and it gives you enough resolution on the surface to map the faults as they come to surface. Our mineralization is about 500 feet deep, so. Uh, mineralized shape outline here from leapfrog is shown based on our logging and um, you can see how it correlates with a bit higher resistivity zones because it is solicified where the mineralization occurs and it's very solicified above where the mineralization occurs. This is a classic um, low sulfidation hot springs type mineralization by contrast to the magmatic style of mineralization we see down at Motherlode, and rumors are high sulfidation mineralization they see up at silicon that Anglo has. So uh, if that's not confusing, the district has multiple styles of mineralization and multiple host rocks. So um, obviously that leads to more and more targets uh, being generated as we, as we continue to evolve our geologic knowledge here. But uh, the seahorse shape sitting in this uh, line nine of this geophysical survey uh, is, is basically leading us to more targets as you go uh, look at the other eight lines to the south, uh, including where this Bear Mountain Fault cuts the uh, resistivity section and provides a, a large conductor on the east side, which we have no idea what that is. I'm guessing it's clay alteration, but uh, we have to drill it. Uh, and then offsets of this um, ore body 
uh, both down to the east and down to the west, maybe up to the west as we go south. And when you start stitching together all, all nine of the lines, um, you can get a three a three dimensional view of where to start drilling. So Seahorse is up on the northernmost line here, and where these structures bifurcate in this area, we've got a target called Pipeline Gulch uh, that we'll be able to drill hopefully Q1 next year, and uh, and then also keep following this uh, Bear Mountain Fault down to the south. Um, we did a cooperative survey here with Corvus. They, their land is, is more or less to the west of this um, outline right here, and then also in the Motherload area. And uh, in order to do nine continuous lines here, we decided this is a great place for us to, uh, to cooperate, share the, share the expense of this survey, and also share the interpretation, uh, which will only help both of us moving forward. So you can see how um, this technique has also mapped the Flores Bar Canyon Fault. It coincides really well with the gravity uh, map and resistive Paleozoics uh, in the center here. And then faults cutting the Paleozoics like right through the SNA resource will lead to more drilling to the north of SNA and hopefully grow that resource. So more area to drill um, and, and lots more targets generated from this geophysics. Um, now I'm jumping down to the southern part of the property. I'm only going to spend uh, about 10 minutes describing this part of the property called the Sterling Mine. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, the last mining here was, uh, I think it was something like 2018 or so, and it was seven and a half grams per ton uh, ore coming from the 144 zone, which is this blue area right here. So I was very intrigued with this area. The grade is typically higher down here than up at Daisy and, and Secret Pass and SNA. Um, and our goal here was to grow the resources, potentially start a small operation. It, was, uh, it required only about six months of permitting because they had basically shut down the operation and kept the permit active while continuing to leach uh, and rinse the pad here. And so we, we got involved, we started drilling, and we found out it's quite complex. But with the complexity comes these structures I was mentioning earlier and how important those are at localizing mineralization. And you can see some of these grades are, are excellent. 50 feet of 0.1 ounce per ton uh, down here at the uh, 144 zone. Um, 250 feet of 0.04 ounce per ton at a new discovery called El Porton. The discovery hole was 380 feet of 0.09 ounce per ton. So that's almost three grams. So uh, these are brand new uh, drill hole assays that we've received. We've got another, I think eight pending uh, from additional holes to the north here. And with those eight, we'll stitch together a three dimensional, um, basically structural map of where to continue drilling we know the zone outcrops to the northeast here at a mine called the Diamond Queen Mine, which again was, map, was mined for a black fluorite. Uh, and it has gold associated with it. We're, we're doing channel sampling along the outcrops up there. So uh, we're down here where we hit this 380 feet, it's about 600 feet deep up at the uh, Diamond Queen Mine, it's uh, it outcrops. So uh, this is a, a brand new evolving part of the Sterling Mine and only because we decided to, our, our geologists decided to drill a hole to try to cut one of the projections of the faults coming up from the 144 zone and I'll set up on a road where we had a pad permitted and, and launch the hole off to the uh, west. So a fantastic new uh, development for Sterling and, and the El Porton discovery. Uh, I'm not gonna spend any more time on the geology here. It's quite complicated. And we're, it's evolving daily right now. These are brand new results, as and these are announced. We're announcing our August 11th news release. Uh, but um, I'd be glad to ask or answer questions if there are any on this this project. So looking ahead, um, we don't plan to slow down. Weather might uh, be an issue at certain projects, like at Wharf. <clears throat> we will we'll definitely 
take the rig from wharf here in the next two weeks. We could get snow now at the end of September up there. So uh, we'll move that rig down to the Crown Project where we'll, we rarely get snow. Um, silver tip, there were six rigs turning and now we're winding that program down. So we should have three rigs turning by the end of September. And those three rigs will be in the lower elevations drilling through the winter and continuing to grow our resources at silver tip. Kensington is a year round program. We'll have three rigs uh, busy there uh, into 2021. Having, uh, if you look at our news release, fantastic new results from uh, Upper Kensington and Eureka, uh, a couple new veins, Elmira, Johnson, and, uh, and Upper Raven. So we've got some veins that are just absolutely fantastic now at Kensington and just trying to figure out what that means for the future, the resources there. Palmarejo, uh, we're up to six rigs turning now. Uh, before we were shut down by the Mexican government, we had 10 rigs turning. Um, we'll slowly, just because of spacing requirements for our personnel and camp, and camp capacity, <clears throat> hotel capacity, um, sleep space in the local town, we're gonna limit uh, six rigs for now. We might be able to get up to seven in, in the next month or so, but I'm not sure if we'll get back to that 10 number. Uh, we've got fantastic results there from just north of Independencia and um, south part of uh, Guadalupe and north part of Guadalupe mine complexes. So uh, if you want more in information on those, those are in the news release. So we anticipate the, the, the Western Nevada projects at Crown and, and Rochester, as I showed, to expand uh, with much larger budgets next year. Um, and basically uh, at Crown, we just got the expanded drill permit. Rochester, we won't get the expanded 200-acre uh, drill permit until uh, sometime around late Q2, early Q3 next year. Um, so we anticipate an aggressive 2021 following on the back of everything we've been doing this year. And hopefully that paves the way to more resource conversion to reserves and, and continuing to grow our pipeline and, and mine lives uh, so we can uh, be more profitable, especially in these metal prices. That's it. Thank you so much. It's really exciting to looking forward to seeing what comes for you the next year. So thank you for sharing. I've had um, questions come through. So like multi parts, so bear with me. Um, so at Rochester, given the style of silver mineralization, remobilization, what's the correlation like with gold statistically and spatially? Um, what is the mineralization style for gold? And if there's no real spatial correlation with silver, how has that affected your exploration strategy when looking for gold? Yeah, we um, great question, um, and and that person probably recognizes that in this environment, gold would not be as mobile, if if not at all, uh, whereas silver is. So um, we're our main focus is is on silver, uh, but uh, we'll take the gold, and and it uh, tends to be in structures, it tends to be structurally controlled, and it tends to surprise us in certain areas. Uh, so there is a correlation sometimes, especially with the vertical structures uh, and structural intersections, uh, but sometimes not. The, by contrast, the new assets I described, Lincoln Hill, Independence Hill, over to the west, are uh, much more gold uh, enriched in terms of you know, just endowment. And uh, that's the area we will focus on, go more gold mineralization. It's a different um, type of mineralization. Uh, structurally controlled, obviously, hosted in the Rochester Formation, but not, um, not it, we, we need to do more work on it. I don't really understand how it's related to the Rochester mineralization specifically. Yeah. Uh, if there's any other questions, you're welcome to um, jump off mute and ask anything or any comments. Uh, it's Stephen here in Sydney in Australia. Uh, just wanting to ask, um, what what constraints, what environmental constraints does Nevada impose on a heat leach operation? And do you anticipate any resistance from locals or any source concerning um, heat leach? 
So we've been um, heap leaching at Rochester since since we purchased the operation. So I think it started again in 1986. Um, oh. On and off. Um, during the metal downturn, there was a bit of a, a an off period, still rinsing the pads, and then it, then ramping back up and expanding in, in 2013, 2014. So that's that actually having a track record means we have much more certainty in getting each of the subsequent uh, POAs. And now we're up to the 11th they just approved. So that track record and our relationship with the local authorities and the federal government pretty much guarantees that when we when we're ready for the next uh amended plan it would be about a three-year process and you pretty much anticipate that and in all the steps now the trump administration has passed a, a ruling that once you file the agency has 12 months to approve but what we found that the agencies will do is they'll make sure you've got basically every T crossed, every I dotted, every study perfectly documented before they accept, before they put a date stamp on it. So building up to the date stamp can take a while. I'm not a I'm not a environmental permitter, but obviously I work with them, uh, and so I'm a, I'm aware of some of the struggles they have. That 300 acre drill permit down south, for example, has taken two years. Uh, part of the reason is there we switched companies over that two year and we took over, but um, that process is typically an 18 month process. So even uh, permitting a larger drill program in Nevada can be quite uh, onerous. But yeah, if you were to start a fresh heap leach uh, operation, uh, somewhere around three years is probably what you're looking at for for everything. Thank you. I, have, I did have one other question. Um, up to the the northwest corner of Nevada, uh, there's a bit of exploration activity occurring up there. Has that sort of attracted uh, your company, Hans? And do you have any comment to make on prospectivity up there? I mean, it's how do you say it? Wasso Wasso country. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's an extension of the uh, of the volcanic terrain. Uh, now, somewhere up there, you also cross into the into the uh, basin and range and sediment hosted terrains. But generally, those are volcanic hosted systems up there. Um, we've looked at submittals up there. Um, I guess even pushing into Oregon, you've got you've got some systems, but um, nothing caught our eye like uh, the Beatty project that Northern Empire grabbed back in uh, 2017. That was, uh, I don't know, but my experience on the on the trends and, and in sediment hosted systems all over Nevada, uh, as soon as I saw, you know, one and a half to three and a half grams oxide gold uh, in seven different layers in, the, in a very structurally beat up mountain range, I got excited. So that's why we, we Put put a emphasis on that, did an investment, and then made the purchase. Um, so it, there are other um, systems up in Idaho that people are exploring. Integra's up in uh, southwest Idaho. Um, over to the east, you've got Liberty Gold now at the Black Pine Project, which are, with a great new discovery. Uh, so people are starting to spread out from the trends and kind of get out of that trend fixation. Uh, now that you've got Nevada gold mines controlling almost all the real estate in those. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing with us and it's really exciting what you guys are doing. So I'm um, looking forward to hearing more and really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story with us. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's been, it's been great. I'm looking forward to more presentations. Uh, this is a great venue. Thank you very much. Thank you.